Oh, I'm sorry. I <laughs> didn't see you there. Welcome back, sisters, to the Skinny Sister Snatch Show. Today, we're going to be talking about racism in the entertainment industry. Take it away, Gabe. Yeah, again, I'm Gabe Rodriguez, and today we're going to be talking about um, are African Americans undermined in the music industry? So, let's start off with slave songs. Besides drum and fife bands that led troops into war back in the colonial age of American history, slave songs, also considered Negro spirituals or songs of the Underground Railroad, were one of the first examples of a notable music, musical movement occurring from the United States. Some slaves attempted to bring over African instruments or recreate them in the United States. Instruments such as the African drum, the flute, the buffalo, a tebo xylophone, or and the panpipe. Their instruments as well as a combination of sorrowful lyrics extending from the difficult work and religious influence lyrics, they were, they were able to create some of the first African-American classics like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Creating a community around their music, they were able to bring new ideas to American music, such as different rhythm patterns and, and different song elements, like call and response. These songs would set the next basis for the next movement of music in America. Blues and jazz. Starting in the 1920s in the progressive era prior and leading up to the 50s and 60s, we saw what we consider now to be what we call popular music in America. With jazz flooding quickly into the homes of many Americans, especially in Harlem and New Orleans. Thanks to the availability of sheet music, record players, and radio, music became accessible to a wider audience. This new audience allowed for the rise of many prominent and recognizable African-American artists like Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, and Miles Davis, who are some of the most popular artists of the genre still today. Stemming out of a similar music scene as the aforementioned cities, the blues, as I like to call it, the original emo, grew in popularity. Lyrically influenced by slave songs in its sorrowful and somber ways, the blues also inspired influence and inspired different instrument instrumentalization as well. With its folk tendencies, uh, the blues would use guitars, mandolins, banjos, basses, harmonicas, and even kazoos. Influential artists of the early blues genre were Blind Lemon Jefferson and Robert Johnson, and allowed for the pavement of country, R&B, and rock. Um, Using blues vocal and lyrical tendencies, along with the energy of the swing era, which had been a remnant of the fading era of World War II, the genre of R&B was something that, was, that kept the energy alive amongst typically young, urban, and black audiences. During the already grand turmoil of the 50s and 60s, the presence of R&B artists, who also sometimes crossed over into rock, was important in keeping different communities alive. Many African-American musicians had gained popularity throughout African-American communities, predominantly th through black-owned or allied radio stations like WERD and WAOK in the South. Little Richard, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, Fats Domino, Big Mama Thornton, and Chuck Berry are some of the greatest and most popular R&B and rock artists of the 50s and 60s, but the racial turmoils for the decades played a crucial role in how labels advertised and released their music. The, the music label Motown held many African-American musicians on their label, like The Temptations and Mar Marvin Gaye, and is still a recognizable name just as it was back then. Motown still had its fierce competition back then, challenging up against different music labels of the time like EMI, Decca Records, and RCI Records, still due to the tensions. Many of the songs during this era were written, recorded, and released by African-American artists, sometimes with success, but many white artists would cover and release these songs as well, or just rely on black artists' songs in general, and more often with relatively more success. 
For example, when Pat Boone covered Little Richard's Tutti Frutti, Boone's version reached the 12th position on the Billboard pop charts, while Little Richard's only reached uh, the 21st position. There are way too many examples of this, so let's do a quick round. Hound Dog, covered by Elvis Presley and originally by Big Mama Thorne. I'm walking, covered by Ricky Nelson and originally by Fats Domino. Why Do Fools Fall in Love, covered by the Beach Boys and originally by the Teenagers. Louie Louie, covered by the Kingsmen and originally by Richard Berry. Cherry O oh Baby, covered by the Rolling Stones and originally by Eric Donaldson. And many, many more. This is such a shame. Rap. You had to get your mumble rap from somewhere. Let's go back to the early 70s when in predominantly black neighborhoods in New York would have block parties and different DJs would have different disco type rhythms as well different MCs would go on top of that and spit some bars and different rhymes. Fast forward to the late 70s in 1979 when the Sugar Hill Gang released their 14 minute long song Rapper's Delight which hit the mainstream but was condensed down to a four minute long version for radio. Rap music again didn't have a cultural movement until the late 80s when we had um, artists like Run DMC hit the mainstream. But going into the 90s you also had artists like N.W.A. and Snoop Dogg become cultural icons and start many different careers of, of rappers that we still see today. Throughout the 2000s and until this decade there have been many different rap movements some that we might regret, but some that we still love today, like SoundClap, Loud Rap Now, and Trap Rap, with artists like Gucci Mane, XXS Tentacion, and Future. So, poses the question. Are, are black people undermining the music industry for their successes? Yes, because nobody would necessarily thinks back in music history just on the top of their heads like, oh, an African-American helped create that genre or an African-American helped popularize that genre as we know it today. So that's answer the question, yes. Black people were very underrepresented in mass media, so much so that they wouldn't even hire black people for black roles. Instead, they would use white actors and paint their skin black, while also making some of their facial features seem more exaggerated to mock and demoralize black people. The most famous example of this type of behavior, Jim Crow, a white man who would smear charcoal on his face while exaggerating his lips to appear like a simplified version of the race he was trying to portray. While also dressing up as a racist stereotype, he would also portray black Americans as stupid, submissive, and subhuman. Some ways that white people would dehumanize black people include drawings, posters, masks that white actors would wear that have prominent red lips drawn on them, and even toys or figurines that people would, could buy. Black people in modern film are portrayed in negative roles. These typically include criminals, slaves, less educated characters, and how sometimes black people are only cast for the sake of diversity, which then means that they are usually the first to die. Even though it's just film and not real, it still has a negative impact on how we view black people. With the popularization of television and how almost every household owns a TV, these views have become more and more widespread. There were also film companies that were owned and run by black people that promoted all the good that the black community had to offer. The reason why these movies are a big role, along with being owned by black people, is the majority of these movies included roles in which black people were put into a position of power that were seen in a good light. The types of opportunities and options black people were given in terms of film roles were usually working for a black owned film company that could only show their films to a black only audience. Or they were given the option to work in a white owned film company that was shown to a white-only audience. However, these types of roles that the white company offered were roles that were in some way made to look like black people should always be lesser than whiteies. 
White savior films harm the black community and prolongs the thought that black people are dependent on white people for help when they are in need. Hollywood and white people like these types of movies because it makes white people feel less guilty about what their ancestors and other racist white people have done to harm black people in the past and in the in the now. These types of films make it look like white people were not too horrible and distracts people from the fact that white supremacy has made life for black people extremely difficult and tr tried to paint white people as the good guys. Typically, very little people recognize how problematic these movies are. The definition of colorism is the belief that a lighter or darker skin color is superior over the other. And Hollywood has shown that throughout history. When black people are hired for roles, they typically choose people who are lighter skinned rather than darker skinned. This causes more discourse in the black community because more and more darker skinned people are treated as if they don't have the accepted skin color for these jobs. And when they do get hired, it tends to be cast into less important roles. Colorism is used not just by white people, but also by people in the black community as well. That's all, sisters. I hope you have a great day. Anything you want to say, Gabe? Just be smart. I hope you learned something. Next time you listen to some music or watch a movie, please think about the history behind it. Be smart. Be educated. Know your history. Thank you. On to the next project.